All right, so I'm going to play some music, make some announcements, and then we will move on to the lecture. I don't think I can hear it. I think the sound is off. Yeah, sounds kind of sounding a little bit funky. Can't hear the sound that well. We can't hear the sound that well. We'll start over. You guys missed it. There. Change this little boy's brain a small piece of advice that took 22 years in the make and I will break it for you now please learn from my mistakes please learn from my mistakes so let's dance to joy division and celebrate the irony everything is going wrong but we're so happy let's dance to joy division and raise our glass to the ceiling because this could all go so wrong but we're so And take a taxi to the darker side of town That's where we'll be And we will wait for you and lead you through the dance floor Up to the DJ booth You know what to ask for You know what to ask for Go ask for Joy Division And celebrate the irony Everything is going wrong But we're so happy Let's dance to Joy Division And raise our glass to the ceiling Cause this could all so wrong, but we're so happy, yeah, we're so happy. Let the love tear us apart. I found the cure for a broken heart. Let tear us apart. Let the love tear us apart. I found the cure for a broken heart. Let tear us apart. As you guys pointed out, that was the Wombats, oh, Dance Joy Division. And I'm using that today because we're going to talk about the fact that we have tended to divide ourselves. Okay. We, and so we're going to talk about the big sort and what that means. But before that, I have some key announcements and some admonishments and some reminders. Okay. Uh, first key announcement there have been some problems with the schedule, of course, since the snowstorm. It's just been. Uh, you know, I, I fixed what I could right away, and then it just took a little bit longer and things did not get fixed. Um, Eric has gone through and fixed the syllabus, fixed Canvas, and fixed um, so, that they're, so that they sync up with Cengage, because Cengage was correct. The syllabus was close to correct, but it had a couple of things that were weird. Um, and so now it is all fixed. 
okay? It should be all set. I think it took him about two hours to do that. I was at the same time trying to figure out what happened to people's exams. And so um, it, that took about two hours. And so we figured that out, which is great. Um, so speaking of assignments we have had due, we had some really great papers. I just wanna say that. There were some really good papers, um, the killers or the invisible man paper, depending on what you, you chose. But there were also about, you know, a bigger proportion of you than normal who did not turn in great papers. So as you begin to look at your grades, if you have questions, I want you to ask yourself this question first. Did I actually read the book, right? And if the answer is no, then you might not be surprised to find out your grade was not that great. Um, there's also some issues as far as the writing itself. Um, one, a lot of stream of consciousness writing. You guys are supposed to be forming an argument. This is academic writing. You're forming an argument. This is to help you for the rest of your life. This is how educated people communicate. Um, there should be a thesis. There should be an argument that makes sense. So not stream of consciousness. Uh, this is not the beat generation. Uh, citation. Apparently, many of you have reported that you were told to never cite internally. I don't know who told you that. I don't know if it was your high school teacher. I, I don't know, but they're wrong. And, and that doesn't work in academic writing. That doesn't work uh, in this class, certainly. Uh, you have to cite internally as well so that we can make a connection. Citation is key. As a matter of fact, I'll just tell you, this is not just this class. I'm part of gen ed assessment, okay? And so gen ed assessment specifically has a category that says, do students understand how to cite internally and cite properly? I didn't make you use a particular format. You just had to make it so that it was clear and, and consistent throughout it, all right? So yeah, McKenna, I agree. I love some parentheticals myself, okay? So internal citation. Um, there were some other connections. If you guys submitted between 11 o'clock and midnight, hey, I'm an up to the last minute worker too, but you had an extra week on this because of the snowstorm. I know maybe you were not working really hard to get it done, but if you're submitting at 11.55 and you haven't had major technical issues, then you probably put it off a little too long. Um, so you have one more paper. So this is what I want to say now. You had an exam. You have a paper. These were both already done in the past. Some of your fellows um, may have some ways to help you out, right? That may happen. Um, but the main thing is this. You have another paper and you have two more exams left. So let's be resilient. Let's pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and get moving forward into the beautiful spring that is coming, okay? So I want you guys to uh, reapply yourself. I know it is the last half of, your, uh, of the year. <laughs> I know it. And I know that in many ways, the last full calendar year has been awful, right? Yeah, we, we've already finished the first half, you guys. I think this week is the the last part of the first half of this semester. So we're in the last quarter of the year. You guys focus, that's what I'm saying here. Now, I'm gonna take attendance and then we are gonna talk about the big sort and uh, you guys are gonna be amazing, All right? That's theoretically if I can make my attendance app work today. So you guys have plenty of time because it's taking me a second to figure it out. Okay, I've hit attendance. And now it says start timer. I've started timer. You have two minutes, let's go. I'll talk about the big sort. All right, Bill Bishop, who is actually a journalist, not a social scientist, not a political scientist or a sociologist, but a journalist that's what his training is in. 
he, he wrote this book in 2008 and we in social science, in political science, really took note of what he was saying because he said something that was the complete opposite of what the conventional wisdom was in political science, both at that time and now. This is actually a big debate in political science. Just so you know, these are our big debates. Are you ready? Is it institutions or culture that shapes democracy? And does polarization come from the elite or come from the citizens? Those are two giant debates in political science. I know you guys are enthralled at this point, but I will tell you that they really matter. These questions matter. So <clears throat> conventional wisdom is, is that it is elite driven, right? That you, we have elected people and that they are farther to the extremes, the left, the right, than we are, okay? But it does not reflect the actual beliefs of real people. Most of us are really in the middle. Um, and the conventional wisdom is also that a significant number of people are gonna stay in the same spot. They're not gonna move from place to place. Morris Fiorina in 2005 and 2009 writes a couple of books. And I, I love these books. I think that his, his evidence really demonstrates um, a lot of um, strength behind this argument that it is elite driven, that polarization is much more an elite function than it is a citizen driven function. Uh, Hill and Tosanovich in 2015 also in their article really demonstrate this as well. But the big sort written in 2008 takes a different approach. So attendance is over, say that you're here over in the chat and Eric will get it for you. Um, but just say here, that's all you got to do. And Eric will take care of it. Do it right now. Say that you are here in the chat now if you missed attendance. All right. Okay. So um, he's saying, look, it's citizen driven. In the 1960s, people began moving more often and they moved based upon cultural affinity. And I, and I want to talk to you guys about what cultural affinity is. That is this idea that there are certain things that we're drawn to. There are certain places that we like to live, uh, places of comfort, things that um, we like to be a part of. Let me give you some examples. I, um, here, let me give you some kind of, it seems like uh, bipolar examples. I have two different kinds of weather that I really enjoy. I really love it when it's hot, like really hot. And I love being near a large body of water when it's really, really hot. At the same time, if someone were to say, what's your favorite weather, weather pattern? I would say Scotland in May. And so 60s, drizzly and gray, right? Lots of green, you know, yes, perfect. So yeah, you know, I got two things going on there that I really like. But if I were thinking about places to live, I might be thinking about somewhere where it's going to be sunny and I'm near the ocean, or I might be thinking of somewhere where, you know, maybe it has kind of a, a uh, you know, northwestern type um, uh, rainforesty type feel, right? So maybe I'm thinking about that when I'm talking about cultural affinity, but it's also things like this. I really like being someplace where even if you're wearing a mask, if you're walking down the street, people smile and wave. I like that in my neighborhood, as I'm driving through my neighborhood or I'm walking my dogs, people wave out their cars, whether I know them or not. I feel good and comfortable about that. I like that, okay? Other people might say, I don't want people to wave at me. I, that's creepy. Um, I don't know them. Why should they be smiling so much, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, I also like things like live music, right? So I like to go places where there's live music. Now, the last year, that really hasn't been an option. But I'll tell you, I love a music festival or an arts festival. I love bustle of people. I like walking to work. These are all things that I really like. And so if I'm looking for a place to move, then maybe a college town where I'm close to campus, where I'm close to work, where I'm close to concerts, where I'm close to those sort of things would work really well for me. Or downtown in a city, that would work for me, okay? But what he saw is that people were moving places to say South Austin, to be close to 
live music and shops and bookstores and things like that. And political polarization was a byproduct because there are also people moving to the North Austin who moved to North Austin because they enjoyed getting in their cars and driving places, i.e. my husband, right? He would like to drive everywhere. He's like, hey, did you want to drive the kids to the playground? And I'm like, no, it's a five minute walk. We will walk the kids to the playground, right? So he likes getting in the car. It's something he really, really likes. Um, and so for him, if we're talking about if we were living in Austin, Texas, for example, he would really like to live on the north side. I'd really like to live on the south side. And so when we talk about cultural affinity, we're also finding that political polarization becomes a byproduct, that maybe the way that we see things politically is also connected to other things that we like or feel comfortable with. So what causes the big sort? A lot of it's human psychology. We like to be places where we are comfortable, right? Um, we like good drinks and good music and good food, but we all define those things differently. Good atmosphere, good architecture, good temperature. What matters to you? What do you like, right? So if you guys were to name your favorite drink right now, the drink you wish you had in your hand, what would it be? Put it in the chat. Let's see it. It's not appropriate for undergraduates. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I wasn't saying alcohol. I, mean, I think my favorite drink would be really good coffee, right? Like a really good coffee is probably my favorite drink. Um, when we talk about good music, can you guys guess what my favorite kind of uh, music is? Guesses, anyone? Alternative, you're absolutely right. You guys did better, okay? Um, nobody else got alternative in my first class. They were like, um, like classic rock. And I was like, are you guys listening? But it's alternative. I like alternative, our Norwegian death metal. Yes, my favorite. Um, so um, alternative music is my favorite music. That's what I like to be around. So that's my good music, which is not necessarily yours, right? What's good food? I mean, my husband had never had sushi until I gave him sushi and now he's like, sushi is good food, right? But he never would have if he hadn't been with me, right? Good atmosphere, good architecture, good temperature. What are those things for you? In 2014, if we look at this and I want you guys to look at the general public the general public category. 36%, a, a little over a third, would consider themselves to be very partisan, steadfast, socially conservative populists, okay? All right, socially conservative populists. In other words, um, really concerned about culture, uh, want their culture to be this. That's 12%, 12% total of the general public. Business conservatives, 10% pro Wall Street, pro immigrant, pro free trade, pro low taxes, less regulation. Solid liberals, about 15% liberal across the board. In terms of partisanship, 36% of the public falls in one of these more diverse areas. Okay? It, it, not diverse, in one of these more polarized areas. Okay? But 54% falls in this middle, but it's not exactly the middle, right? And, and I think that's what we get so confused about is that it's just less predictable. You don't have a solid ideology. So there may be, you feel this way on one issue, but you can be swayed absolutely on this issue because you're not so sure of where you are. And maybe it's related to with hard pressed skeptics, the fact that you're financially stressed because 2020 has been rough. And 2021 continues to be rough. There are the faith and family left, racially diverse, but religious, right? In many ways, kind of like those steadfast conservatives, but they see religion a different way. And then there's about 10% who are just bystanders. And that's the general public. Now I want you to look to the far right side column. Of those who are politically engaged, 
57% are those partisan anchor, acres, anchors, sorry. And 43% are that less partisan, less predictable. So that means that the minority who are more polarized are the ones who are really driving politics, really driving politics. I, I uh, can't find something similar like this on Pew, and so I need to dig somewhere else and see if I can find it. But in 2008, Pew asked a question about mobility, education, and affluence. And they found that people with a college degree, 75% of them after college, after moving out, have moved at least once. They move longer distances, they move more often, they're more likely to move multiple times, and they move based more on employment, and the most affluent are the most mobile. For people who only have a high school education, only half of them after moving out of their parents' house, somebody asked this earlier, does that count whenever I moved across town from my parents? No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about leaving the city. We're not just talking about moving houses, right? But they tend to move within the same state. They're more likely to move only once, right? And employment is not a real consideration in their move. So if you think about where I have moved to, um, you know, and, and we're not talking about, I spent a couple years living abroad, but those were more mobile. I wouldn't call those actual moves, right? But I moved to South Texas. Um, I moved to uh, Arizona. I moved to Oklahoma. And then again in Oklahoma. So that's four moves. It was related to my employment quite a bit, um, but there was also some cultural factors, right? I mean, why did I stay in the Southwest? Um, how, how does it matter if I am connected? You know, how do my parents' location matter? You know, it mattered, right? So there are also culturally based cleavages. Um, religion and church, you know, we choose those based upon traditional or non-traditional bases more conservative or less conservative. I was talking uh, in my other class with a, one of the fellows. I know his religious background is something we've talked about um, as friends, right? And so when we talk about that, we're talking about um, how we make choices. The more experiences that you have, the more you travel, the more education you have, the more you are analyzing using logic to make decisions about things like your religion. So uh, I can tell you that absolutely uh, my religious choices uh, are different than the way that I was brought up. They're somewhat connected. They're definitely connected. You know, I don't, I didn't have a bad religious upbringing. I don't have any regrets or anything like that, but I made different choices in terms of lifestyle. Um, walking, proximity to restaurants and shops, healthy pursuits. You know, some people want to be near um, wildlife preserves. Somebody, some people want to be in a city where there's a um, major league baseball stadium, right? People are choosing things like this. But also things like tribes, who we date. And even though we do a lot of online dating, we're being even more exclusive by choosing things like farmersonly.com or christianmingle.com because we are asking for a particular type of lifestyle. We are not open to meeting people outside of that. The alt-right, white nationalism, which has really risen in the last 10 years, we see a, we've seen a lot of that. Um, that's connected because of social media, people only talking to people who also fit in with that. And the same with Bernie Bros on the left, you know, hearing that over and over and over again. Well, there's some consequences of these cultural cleavages and cleavages mean divide guys. So come on. So cleavages, these consequences are major because we have high stakes because it's what we are. And you're absolutely right. It is an echo chamber, okay? And we keep amplifying, we keep amplifying 
these ideas. And so, you know, I kind of think this and this person takes a little bit further and it gets farther and farther and farther. And it gets to the point where different opinions threaten our way of life. Think about that, right? We're talking about politics and I'm talking about taxes. And suddenly this opinion is threatening your way of life because I don't agree with you. We see others as immoral and dangerous if they don't share our views politically. There's the, there are these gulfs that exist between business conservatives and President Trump supporters on things like trade, immigration, and cultural issues. Why? What are the big gulfs there? They're, these are both conservatives, right? But why on the, the more populist conservatives versus business conservatives? Why in these areas are these big gulfs in place? What, if you're a business conservative and, and you guys were just getting into ideology, so if you don't know, you don't know. But if you're a business conservative, it's important to you that there be very open trade, low regulation, low taxes. Why? Why do you, why is that ideologically? And, and you're right, it's economic versus social conservatives, right? And so there's a big split there. And so this is what you want. Whereas, if we're talking about social conservatives, suddenly those ideas also mean things like immigrants and free trade. And so that's a threat to the values that they see as what America is. You know, so think about the slogans, make America great, make America great again, or keep America great, save America, right? The whole idea is this is who we are. This is our identity. This is who we're supposed to be. And so it's an attack culturally to say, hey, wait a second. I, I don't agree with you on that. What about this? That I'm attacking personally someone. And this becomes a major problem. It gets really personal. In 1960, and understand that my parents got married in 1966. 5% of Republicans and 4% of Democrats would be displeased if their children married someone of the opposite party. My dad was a Democrat. My mom was a Republican. Everybody was happy. They both grew up in the same teeny tiny little area. But in 2010, half of Republicans and a third of Democrats, this is a huge jump, would be displeased if their children married into the opposite party. It has become so ingrained in our culture, our political views, that we cannot separate them. As someone pointed out, um, there's lots of problems here with an echo chamber. And, and part of that has to do with the fact that media has been transformed. And Eric's gonna talk about this next week. But media has been transformed. When Richard Nixon watched Walter Cronkite say, it appears that the president knew about the break-in and lied about what he knew. When he said that and Nixon watched it, he said, I've lost, Nick I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the nation. We no longer have touchstones like that where we said, hey, here's fact reporting that we understand to be facts. Instead, we've splintered our news outlets in such a way that we cater to our different views. Using my dad as an example, about 10 years ago, I got a call from my dad and uh, maybe 12, and he had just seen Keith Olbermann for the first time on MSNBC. And he was like, Melody, have you seen this guy? talks the truth. And he was like in, he was in. That's what he watched from then on. Because he felt like he was connected to the person who was giving the news. We also have a lot of confirmation bias and this is us. This is something we have to work on ourselves. 
okay? They put people into an MRI machine. People who had, you know, said, hey, I'm more liberal or I'm more conservative after, you know, they did this sort of survey that we do in social science. And, and the, the more conservative and the more liberal people went into this MRI machine. And they played two newscasts, except for they were the same one. And if you were conservative and you heard, it's Fox News bringing you this news story, and they give the news story, then your brain, they literally watched it on MRI. Your brain was open, you took in the information. If it said, this is MSNBC, and here's the news story, people's brains closed off. And vice versa with those who, you know, reported or, you know, according to the surveys were more liberal. We shut off things that we do not believe to be accurate or that don't seem to fit with what we believe. And we do have this echo chamber effect where we hear it more and more and it gets bigger and bigger. And you add that to advocacy organizations who say, hey, how can I use this movement to my advantage? And so the Koch brothers give a terrific amount of money to Tea Party across the United States so that they get better tax and regulation standards for their businesses and make more money. It has nothing to do, has absolutely nothing to do with what their cultural values are, but they fund it to ensure that they get the financial advantage. In terms of brain development, um, the same sort of MRI experiments were done, uh, whether it's nurture or nature, I don't know, um, but people who, you know, again, kind of in a survey were more conservative or more liberal, um, were shown pictures and if you were more conservative, you were much more likely to kind of have this disgust or fear reaction to certain pictures. Uh, they had a, you guys have to do the word for me. Are you ready? They had a bigger a Magdala. Damn it. No, it's not amygdala. A, amygdala. Ha ha. Amygdala. Thank you. They had a bigger amygdala or a fear center, right? The liberal brain had a bigger anterior cingulate cortex. In other words, was much more open to logical arguments. Carrie, you have a question. No, I hit that on accident, sorry. Okay. In 1976, right? So we're getting back to the big sword idea here. In 1976, these were the landslide counties in the United States. Um, the Black ones were uh, Democratic landslides. That's where the Democratic candidate won by 60, more than 20 percentage points, more than 60 to 40, okay? The gray ones are where the Republican uh, won by 20 points or more, okay? And I want you guys just to look at, don't worry about Democrat, Republican. I just want you to look at how much space it covers in terms of these counties. Now, Look at 2000. That's a massive difference. <clears throat> when we talk about landslide, this is my home thing over here. It's still white, not quite a landslide in 2004. When you talk about landslide, that means that everybody around you is voting the same way, whichever way it may be. And it makes it really tough, it makes it really tough for you to get active if you disagree. So homogenous groups are gonna grow more extreme. The more alike we are, the more we keep saying the same things again and again. It's like being around a bunch of graduate students, right? You know, if you listen to a bunch of graduate students all the time, they get more and more extreme. Eric, am I wrong about this? Oh yeah, I'm crazy extreme. I'm not saying Eric himself. Oh. I'm just saying the topics and, and you oh, probably, yeah, do. because of 2020, don't get those same sort of conversations we used to have, right? But you know, if we're talking about things, we get more and more extreme because we're so much alike. We're studying the same things, right? It's gonna create an echo chamber. 
Go ahead, Eric. I was going to say higher education. Get really excited about that. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, people do, you know, and, we, and we, especially when we're talking about the same things and we're all coming from the same place. Mm -hmm. Creates an echo chamber in which our views are reinforced rather than challenged. And look, you guys, even those of you who are 25 years of age, aged, aged people, you're still young. Okay? You're still young. You have to be challenged to grow. If you're constantly, if you are constantly only hearing people who agree with you, then your brain is going to stagnate and you're not going to grow. And we're going to hear all these things over and over again. If majorities grow, minorities are going to retreat. In the state of Oklahoma, for example, if you look at things like the way that People have been voting on um, medical marijuana or they vote on um, <clears throat> other issues like uh, criminal justice reform. You're going to see much more liberal tendencies. But the larger a majority grows, the more often that these majorities get bigger or the, that they win, that they went over and over consistently, minorities tend to retreat and it reduces participation on both sides. Side. It creates apathy on both sides. Minorities just shut up because it's not worth it to them. And majorities don't have to do the work, so they don't show up either. It creates a lot of apathy whenever we talk about politics. It also accentuates the polarization of political parties. Opinion is naturally more complex and diverse, okay? And so we might see something more on a conservative side or a liberal side, depending on the issue. But what we have seen recently, what we have seen recently is that people are changing their attitudes to align with their chosen political party, rather than saying, oh, you know, I, I'm not sure this is political or I, I disagree with my party on this. People are changing their attitudes. Let's take, for example, Let's take, and that's a good question, Nolan. So hold on a second, okay? Um, but let's take the example of um, views on Russia. In 2012, 80% of Republicans believed that Russia was a major threat to the United States. In 2018, that was down to 30% based upon the change in the Republican Party on their views on Russia. Now, Nalan asks a question. She says, hey, if people are generally hateful, do we have a responsibility to listen? Um, you know, I, the question is not exactly, right? You don't have to listen to hate. You don't have to listen to things that are offensive to you. But at the same time, listening to the content whenever we're talking about issues is necessary. And I, I think it's necessary to kind of keep that open mind. If, if it's all hatefulness, then, you know, it's gone way too far. That's one of the reasons why we have these labs is so that you guys can speak in a civil manner about issues that aren't filled with hate. And Blaine is saying, why are we framing this as liberalism and conservatism as the only ideologies? Well, I'm talking about liberal versus conservative on every issue. I'm not saying Democrat, Republican. OK, I'm saying that liberal and conservative on all these issues do actually do have the spectrum. OK, when you take the ideology quiz or the I side with quiz, you're going to see a lot of that. But it tends to be this dimension on all of these different things. Um, and again, Aislinn says it depends on your moral standpoint, but that's the whole point. The question is. Our taxes about morality. And if we're saying it is morality, then we start defending our way of life, not farm subsidies or minimum wage. We're saying you're attacking me and my morality because you disagree with me about these things. And so dragging morality and values into it makes it much more personal and much more.
polarized. The more extreme districts we have, the more extreme Congress. And a lot of this has to do with gerrymandering, which we're gonna spend some time talking about in about four weeks. Um, but the percentage of moderates has been dropping in the House and Senate. We're talking, you know, about 50% of them were moderates in the 1950s, and now it's less than 10%. So it's really tough to um, negotiate. We have, we have government deadlock as a result. We have a lot of gridlock. Even in 1977, 40% of them were moderates. Uh, it says the Senate has lost all but one moderate Dem. I should actually amend that. It's two-ish. Um, I, I guess I'm going to call one of them a moderate Dem, uh, more of a, I'm going to reserve judgment on that and just say moderate, two moderate Dems. Um, but this predicts government gridlock. There's no national opinion. We aren't looking for what the national opinion is. We aren't looking at the fact that 78% of the people want this or 67% or even 55%. We're not looking at those numbers. We're not looking at the common good. We're not looking at what's best for the nation. Instead, all we care about is our gerrymandered districts and getting reelected. Local or district opinion is what matters and it makes compromise really different. Okay, so let's do a um quick experiment okay think of your home community what's it like what are the people like is it characterized by um high church membership baptists evangelicals mega churches a rural committee community with a declining population a high levels of gun ownership hunters 4-h rodeos or it, it is an ethnically homogenous suburb if it's any of these type a in the comments hold on just a second or is it more closely like urban density, high-tech businesses, research parks, college and college towns, uh, alternative bookstores, bike paths, art districts, lots of single young professionals, ethnic and racial diversity, new immigrants. If it's more like this, press B. You guys are mainly from A. There's some Bs sprinkled in there, but it looks like an awful lot of As. Um, Matthew is saying C, um, but uh, these are our two choices which is it closer to, okay? Luke has a question. What's your question, Luke? Sorry, I accidentally clicked that. But you have an important question to ask anyway? No, ma'am, it was an accident. I know, I was joking. See, sense of humor, Luke, sense of humor. All right. Dr. Well, Allen. Yes, Kylie. I have a question about the political candidates and stuff. So, okay. Sometimes there are like moderates that run for the House or for the Senate, even in like state elections, but they tend to not get as many votes, even though isn't it that the majority of the population is moderate? So why is that? Well, because they're running in a primary. Okay. Right? Yeah. And so, and so it's going to be more extreme in a primary. Um, and, and that's a good, when we talk about this, and we're going to talk about this in like two weeks, we're going to talk about the way to run an election. And so is this the best way to do it? Or should we do a jungle primary where we get to, you know, maybe choose someone who's the best? Or should we do a, you know, a single transferable vote? Would that be better? Right? These are all options. Ranked choice says Samuel, which is the same thing. So, you know, you know, th that's part of it. Part of it is, and, and this goes back to, remember I told you guys there are two big debates in political science. Um, so I gave you, this is one of them, the one that we're talking about here, elite driven or citizen driven in terms of polarization. But the other is, as I said, is it the institution or the culture that really determines things? And this is one of those reasons why I'm an institutionalist. I think a lot of it has to do with the way our voting systems are set up. Right, and that makes a difference. Okay, you guys have a poll, are you ready? I've activated the poll and here it is. How do we bridge the divide, right? How do we bridge this divide? Um, David is gonna ch choose Thunderdome. Um, you can actually vote for Democrats in Oklahoma if you're registered independent um, and it depends on your state as Samuel is pointing out. So Texas has some open primaries, uh, Oklahoma Democrats. And the thing is the parties often decide. In 
California, it's all kind of a jungle primary. Uh, there's Louisiana has opened it up in that way too. So it does depend. All right, you guys still have a minute and 18 seconds to answer this poll. How do we bridge the divide? How do we bridge the divide? One whole minute left. Now, and, and again, remember, you can still vote for whoever you want in the general election, but by aligning yourself with the party, and parties aren't all bad. You know, I'm hearing you guys and you're like, eh, party. Um, understand there are reasons for parties and we'll talk about that. Um, but you can always vote for somebody else in the general, but in the primary, that's where you choose who you, your candidate is, who it is that you want to be your candidate. And that's why you're doing that. You're choosing that for your party. And so if you don't fit with your party, you don't fit with your party. Um, and that's that's that. Not very many people of you, not very many of you completed the poll. Looks like a lot of people dropped out of class. I'll have to check the uh, Excel report on today, it looks like. Um, oh, it was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, but it looks like 39% of you are gonna say open conversations and 31% are gonna say education. 20% is going to say um, engagement in community. And then also 11% uh, are going to say impossible at Thunderdome. You guys are much more cynical than in my early. Um, but that's your choice. I mean, you know, the, the truth is, is if you didn't want to vote, and, and this is Matt saying, if you're a Democrat and didn't like Hillary and wanted to vote for a Republican other than Trump in the beginning, then you're screwed you could be a Republican then. I mean, that's that's your option if, if you cared more th for that. And also in the primary, there were lots more options than Hillary Clinton. I mean, so in the primary, you get to choose somebody else. Bernie Sanders won Oklahoma, as a matter of fact, in 2016. So, I mean, whenever it comes down to it, the parties are making those decisions for the major party candidates, right? Um, but you're also making choices about what party you want to align with. If you don't like a person because of their personality, but you like their issues, um, again, we'll talk about parties more later, um, then in Europe, you wouldn't really be looking at their personalities. Um, it's much less based upon personality. It's much more based upon issues and political stances. Um, it depends. It depends on the system and it matters. All right. Um, but that's really it. All right.